sponsored by George the Farka. Farkas. Farkas. It is to commemorate. George Farkas, we do thank you for sponsoring. It to commemorate the 30th year of of Frida's father, <coughs> Nachman Ben Yehuda Arya Leib, Zechron Ali Bracha, the Neshama should have an Aliyah. So we do thank you for sponsorship. <laughs> Page 78, Parshat Vayera. It is a portion that begins with uh, God appearing to Avraham as he is recovering from the Brit Milah at age 99. Uh, we have these unique guests that make their appearance there, which are familiar with the tradition that we are dealing with angels. Uh, we are informed, and Avraham is informed, that the city of Sodom needs to be destroyed due to the lack of values, ethics, sensitivity towards one another, re respect of the other person's property and welfare. And then we find a good Jew in the process of negotiation, where Abraham Avinu turns to the Almighty and says, hey, perhaps there's some righteous people there, save the city. And the negotiations continue, right? 50 people, 45, 40, 30, 20. That is what we have there. Now, in this portion, we're going to be dealing with two civilizations, two civilizations. We're going to be dealing with Sodom, and we're going to have to understand what it symbolizes and what lessons we could learn from such a civilization, what not to be. And then, in the second half of the portion, we're going to be introduced to another civilization, <coughs> the Plishtim. Plishtim. The Pelishtim, which are everywhere throughout Tanakh, the word uh, Palashtim, Peleshet, relates to the word invaders. And they were viewed, there are Egyptian records that these Pelishtim are viewed as invaders. They do not originate from that region. And there is a strong belief in those who read Tanakh, and some archaeologists agree as well, when it comes to some ceramics that they found in earthenware, that it appears that these Pelishtim originate in the islands of uh, Greece, and it will explain a little bit about their culture, and it will give us an understanding of what Avraham is confronting with these Pelishtim. It's very interesting that uh, the Romans renamed the land of Judah, the land of... The Palestine, Palestina, Palestinians, and the whole essence of the word Palestinian itself is that they are invaders from the outside, which is interesting, <laughs> uh, interesting to note. But that is civilization too that Abraham is going to be dealing with, and we're going to have to note that there are significant differences, Sodom and Palestine. So we could call this parsha a tale of two cities. Right? We could go ahead and talk about Sdom and the Pelishtim. Now, when, when it comes to Pelishtim, when it comes to Avraham Avinu's uh, negotiation on page 82 with the Almighty, where he turns to the Almighty and says, what, you want to destroy a city? Perhaps there are some righteous people there, and in the merit of these righteous people, you should save that city. This is what Abraham is saying, and you have to remember that this is a city that has five boroughs, right? So a corrupt city with five, with five boroughs, and I'm making reference to any city at all, but, right? <laughs> New York values, for, uh, as if you remember from two years ago. So, Abraham Avinu turns to the Almighty, and he says on page 82, verse 24, Ulai yesh chamishim tzadikim betochayir, you know, perhaps God, Perhaps you have in the city 50 righteous individuals. Ha'aftispe, are you going to go ahead and destroy? Veloti sala makom, and you are not going to forgive lema'an chamishim atzadikim, lema'an, for the sake of these 50 people. Lema'an. Now, God responds in verse 26, 
And he says to him, Vayomer Hashem im emza besdom, chamishim tzadikim betoch ha'ir. Indeed, if I find in the city of Stom 50 righteous people in the midst of the city, then venasati l'chol amukam, I will go ahead and spare ba'avuram, ba'avuram, on their account. Now, note the difference here between Avraham Avinu saying it is lema'an chamishim, lema'an chamishim, for the sake of, and God Almighty saying, venasati l'chol amukam, not lema'anam, which would be the word Avraham Avinu uses, but rather ba'avuram. Keep that in mind. Now, the city of Zdom itself, you've heard the Midrashim throughout the year of the corruption, of the mistreatment, mistreatment of the outsider, of a culture that believes that what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours. Right? To go ahead and do, to create a net for society, for those who are in need, absolutely not. And to create a situation where our country is attractive to the outsiders and they're going to come, that's considered a crime. To welcome a guest into our city where we are giving from that which is ours to others, charity, that is something that you deserve the death penalty for. It will destroy our society and you've got to make great, you might got to make Sdom great again. That was really what is the approach. Now, I'm not God forbid comparing anyway, but nevertheless, you got to admit that there is, when, when you have, when you talk about nationalism, there is a little bit there, something of it's, it's ours. We don't want to give someone else. There is something there that in Judaism we do believe in. Tzedakah, chesed, that is our core. That is our essence. And we have been fighting Sdom from that point on, and in Jewish law there is a concept where we, call, we are told you have to be kofin al midat zdom. In other words, if you have something, if you have a property, if you have some kind of entity that could benefit others, and you lose absolutely nothing by allowing others to use it, the Jewish court could force you to allow others to benefit because they could force you not to follow the philosophy of Sdom. Sdom is evil. You, what you have is there for others. Now it could be financial gifts that the Almighty has given you. You have that responsibility of thinking about others. It could be, it could be emotions. In other words, if someone is very happy and feels good about themselves, they have to walk in and use that feel-good feeling to give to others who don't have that feel-good. We could do it with that as well. It could be with love, attention, it could be with so many things. That is the essence of Judaism. We are not Sdom. Kofin al midat Sdom. And therefore, Mishnah Pirkei Avot says, if someone walks in and says, Shali, Shali v'shala, Shala, that which is mine, is mine. That which is yours, is yours. Right? That's the Sdom attitude. There was a rabbi who was chief rabbi of Tel Aviv in the 1930s, Rav Amiel, and he, he claimed that when it comes to this ch challenge that we are dealing with today, are we capitalists or are we socialists? Right? What are we as Jews? So he claims that you find them both in Tanakh, right, in their corrupt version, of, unfortunately. That as a society, we're going to build one society, right, communism, and we're going to go ahead and share everything, and we could reject God as a result. Says Rav Amiel, that was the Tower of Babel. When it comes to civilization, that says, what do you mean? What is yours is yours, right? It's yours. You worked hard. It's yours. Well, unfortunately, capitalism in a corrupt form, obviously, will be found in stone. Judaism, he knows, does believe that you have what's yours, but then you recognize that it was given to you by the Almighty to do good with it. And therefore, ma'aser, when it comes to the gifts, to the poor, to the Kohen, to the Levi, to the person who's teaching Torah, to, when it comes to organizations, what you give, it is not a government that takes from you, it's, it's yours, and then you recognize, you know why it was given to me? To do good with it. You are the one that gives, right? So obviously it is a far better version than the stone capitalism uh, that the Torah is warning us against. Now, there is something else about stone. So first piece of information you have to remember is the difference between Avraham Avinu, turning to the Almighty, and say, will you not 
Will you not save that city lemaan for the sake of the fifty? And God responds, you know what? I'll save ba'avur. Where there is a difference, we're going to have to focus on that. Now, then after the city, after the city itself is in the process of being destruction, on verse eighty-six, the Torah actually <coughs> notes on <coughs> verse fifteen when this destruction occurs, when it is occurring, what time of the day, on page 86, which is chapter 19, <laughs> verse 15, where the Torah tells us, Uchmo hashachar Allah, and just as dawn was breaking, that is when the angels urge Lot and says, get out, because action begins now. Why specifically Kmo HaShachar Allah? So the rabbis share with us, and this is something that Rashi notes as well, that you should know that we are dealing here with, uh, with a society. We're dealing here with a society that was pagan. That was part of their culture. You begin believe in all kind of forces. And there were those among the stomachs that worshipped the moon, and there were those that worshipped the sun. And there was a concern that those who worshipped the moon would claim that if the destruction would occur during the day, they would have said it would have never happened at night, right? Because the moon would have been there. And if it would have occurred at night, those who worshipped the sun would say, if that would have, we would have been protected by the God of sun. So God works it out. It is a time where both of these celestial bodies are up in the sky. This is what Rashi shares with us. It's actually a very important rabbinic statement because it is telling us remember they are pagan they are pagan and a pagan society which begins believes in charms that all you have to do to get what you need is hold something in your pocket or worship something or offer some plants or some animals to some kind of force or to some kind of figure you are safe you can do whatever you want right forget about values all you got to do is satisfy those absurd gods that they worship, mission accomplished. That is Sido. Now, another piece of information you have to keep in mind as you deal uh, with, with Sidon is the fact that we have Mishpacha there. Who is our Mishpacha that lived in Sidon? And unfortunately, although he believed that he is there to have a positive impact on the city, sometimes the traffic goes in the wrong direction. He becomes a little bit of Sidon as well. And that is Lot. And when you read some sections about Lot, you just feel uncomfortable. It was one of those sections that in school we would skip, right? Because for the third grader, it was not appropriate to read, and therefore the third grader only remembered that. Because when the Rebbe says you are skipping, you know it is something you have to read very, very carefully, because it's going to be interesting, and that is what you remember. So, as... Mr. Lot, which, by the way, ha- carries some attributes from Avraham Avinu, and believes in Achnasat Orchim, Achnasat Orchim, welcoming the outsider, Lot believed that is something that is so much of my identity, I will not end it when I am in Zdom. However, when the community comes, they protest, right? The mob comes, and they are banging on his door for such a violation of what we are about, he makes them an offer. And he turns to them on page 86, verse 8, and he says, listen, I, I, you know, I want to do my mitzvah. I want to do my good deed. That is so important. So you know what I'm going to offer you? I'm going to offer you in verse 8, Hinel da li shtei banot. I have two daughters, right? Who have never known a man. I shall bring them out to you, and you... Do to them as you please. So this is, you you realize what you just read. He wants to perform the mitzvah of welcoming the guests. Achnasat orchim. Magnificent. So he has a community that has a problem with it. So he's a negotiator. How does he negotiate? He offers his daughters. And we are sickened by this statement. And we ask ourselves, wait a second. If this is someone that learned by Abraham Avinu, shouldn't he have known what basic decency is about? So we are very, very uncomfortable with him, and the chapter continues 
with uncomfortable relationship that he has with his daughters later. And supposedly he was drunk and not aware, but we have a feeling perhaps he was, because this is a person that is lacking basic derech eretz. That is what we are dealing with. So keep that in mind as we deal with stone. And then we have to move on to society number two on page 90. Society number two. Uh, society number two is where Avraham Avinu, on, on page 90, chapter 20, he has to move on to a different region. Now, Avraham Avinu, you have to remember, is interacting with people and with cultures. And there's a shift that is occurring now. When, up until now, he's in this dome region, and he's trying to have an impact against their philosophy and way of thinking. Now he is moving into a different region, right? And he's going to the south, and he settles between a place called Kadesh and a place called Shur, okay? And here he is interacting with Avimelech, and again he has the challenge <coughs> of his wife being taken. God intervenes, and when in verse, if you turn to page 92, and this is after the king of Imelech turns to Abraham and says, why were you not honest with me? Right? Don't you understand? If you would have just told me that she is your wife, I wouldn't have done anything. Right? After all, you are now, this is no, we are no stone. Right? We are the Plishtim. We have values. We have decency. Right? We have a society where there's an understanding that you do for others because it creates harmony. Why were you not honest? Why did you treat me with such disrespect? And in verse 11, Abraham says to him, Ki amarti, verse 11 on page 92, Vayomar Abraham, Ki amarti, you know what I said when I interacted with you people? Perhaps you are righteous, but there's something you are lacking. Rak ein yirat elokim bamakom hazeh. You know what is lacking? There's no fear of God. You can have values. And the plishtim, and remember, if we link them, which in the past we've detailed, how indeed this civilization and this society is linked and it finds roots in ancient Greece, where there's a concept of social harmony, where many, you know, they call it the cradle of Western civilization, right? That indeed was their civilization, but he's telling them, you know what, if there's no fear of God, you could have culture, right? You could be a hub for thinking, and you could have universities, and you could have intellectuals, and you could talk about social justice, and you could talk about Western values, but without the fear of God, I'm sorry, I cannot trust you, and I have to go ahead and defend myself, because you are lacking that. Yirat Elohim was fascinating, is in Parashat Bashalah, where God Almighty says, you know what? You guys are leaving Egypt. I'm not going to send you derech eretz plishtim. And it's fascinating when we are so much of who we are about, we always talk about derech eretz. In any classroom you walk in, right? Next door, it's Chaim or one day TTC. You're going to one day see these big posters that say derech eretz kadmala Torah. And that is obviously fundamental to develop good Jewish people that you have to understand that, yes, we focus on religion and we focus on practices, but you have to be very, very careful because if you don't have derech eretz, the way of the land, a decency, treating people with respect, right? To be in some ways culture, to understand what is right and what is wrong, before you walk into Torah, your Torah is going to be lacking. Derech eretz, kadmala Torah. The Philistines had that derech eretz, right? This is a society that indeed believed in social harmony. Derech Eretz Plishtim. You realize how the Torah puts those words together. And many commentators like the Chastam Sofer know that it represents not just the way of the land, but the way of the land as in practice. They were people with decency, but they were lacking Yirat Elohim. So this is a whole new, a whole new battle that Avraham Avinu is facing. A whole new culture, that he has to adjust his practices. Now, by the way, the Yitzchak is born on page 94, Mazel Tov, and we have the interaction with Ishmael, which we discussed, and then on page 98, the, the Philistines make their grand return, on page 98, and they have an issue with wells, they have an issue with wells, and eventually there's a covenant where Avraham Avinu is given a green light to do what he wanted to do, what his essence was about. 
what was his essence to teach, to reach out, and through acts of kindness to touch souls. You know, you think about, the, you talk about hachnasat orchim of Abraham Avinu. This was not a hachnasat orchim of having someone for a Shabbos meal, right, and just schmoozing there. This was much, much more. Sometimes, you know, we travel once in a while. Like in this past summer, we went, we, went uh, we were in Cleveland. So we go and, you know, you buy some food in a supermarket, and then eventually you come home. There's something very exciting about coming home, that you could have a nice, hot meal, right? A nice, hot meal at home. And we have, we, uh, you know, it could be scrambled eggs, which, you know, which it, it, for some that might be a basic. For us, it is the most enjoyable meal. Why? A warm, hot, magnificent meal after you are on the road. Now, let's go back 3,000 years and you are traveling throughout the desert. And what exactly did you carry? In your skins you had some water, a little bit, that you would have to sip. And then most probably you had some dried protein, maybe some dried uh, meats perhaps, and other dry, dry foods that you were able to carry with you that did not have too much moisture because you don't want them to spoil. And you don't want to have to carry the load of the moist food. Some of you who traveled like to Vietnam, you probably could relate to traveling to the other end of the world where the only thing you have is a few packets of, 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 of tuna perhaps. And then you are offered a nice warm meal by Avraham Avinu. Imagine that you walk in, you walk in, and this is a person that's well respected already, and he's serving you. And he's giving you delicious freshly prepared food. Imagine the gratitude you have towards such an individual, right? People that travel the world, what do they say? Thank God for Chabad, right? That's one of why. Chabad is there. Chabad performs that you can't yeah. beat them on, their, on the chesed. You can't beat them because they are there and you have a, me, a, a warm, enjoyable, fresh meal where you could be anywhere, right? From Hong Kong to... to, to, to to Ireland, or I should say Ireland, actually Ireland too, but even to Iceland, I was trying to say they moved recently. That is what Chesed is about. So that's Abraham Avinu. And when he provides that food, he is not just giving those who need something physical, he's giving them something spiritual. Because he tells them, don't be grateful to me, be grateful to the higher being that has provided all for us. And let me tell you about this higher being. Do you think that the higher being is satisfied when you offer him sacrifices? No. He wants you to be just. He wants you to be righteous. He wants you to be sensitive towards others and recognize him. And there are ways to live as a de decent person. Let me tell you about the Noahide laws. Let me tell you about the sensitivity you're supposed to have towards nature, towards animals, right? Reject paganism, respect the property of someone else, right? Don't rip off a limb from a, a, a limb. Right? From a living animal, don't cook your lobster alive. In other words, he would give them a list of practices that would define the ethical path of living. And he had an impact. The man had an impact because he believed in it. And you know, when you interact with someone that is real, you indeed are impacted by the words that come out of that person. That was Avraham Avinu. And he was doing that in this dome region, but now he moves into this new, new region where he is dealing with the Philistines, where there's a little bit of a, a different philosophy. You know, it's interesting that whenever we are told that Abraham Avinu and Sarah settle in a location between two cities, if you look at the names of those two cities, he is trying to get a message across. For example, in Parashat Lech Lecha, we are told that when he entered into the land of Israel, he settles between Bet-El and Ha'ai, with an Ai. Now, Ha'ai comes from the word I'im, which really means a destroyed city. Ha'ai, right? Samot Yerushalayim Le'im, in other words, they destroyed. So he settled between two cities. One of the cities was called Bet-El, a house of a god, and the other one was known as the destroyed city. So when you think about it, Abraham Avinu walks into the land of Israel. That really is establishing a pattern for us of how to view our entry and our existence in the land of Israel. We in the land of Israel always have to be mindful of the fact that we make choices. When we make good choices, we are building the house of God. Right? When you are righteous, when there's justice, when there's a commitment to Torah, when there's a commitment to God, you are in the process of building a Bet El. 
If on the other hand, you are lacking values and decency and a commitment to the God who gave you this land, you know what you have on the other hand? A destroyed city. Hi. And Abraham Avinu walks in, walks into that country. And we are being told that as we walk in, or as we are present in that land, we are always facing this contrast between a Betel and a Hai. So keep that in mind. And also, when, if you go back to, if you don't mind, if you could please turn to page 90. And this is Abraham's interaction. Abraham's interaction with the Plishtim. And with Avimelech, we are told that he settles there ben Kadesh u ben Shur. Now the word Shur actually is to see, to see. Ashreno, if you remember in the vision of uh, Bilam, I shall see it. Not Sa'adu and Parshat Vayachi were talking about that when Yosef was so beautiful that the daughters would walk on the wall to, ha to get a glimpse of him. Not Sa'adu alei. Sure, to go ahead and see him. So here we have, if you take the word sure, which means what's, what is seen, what is visible, which signifies physical beauty, harmony, right? Greek culture, right? It's talking about what is magnificent, what is pleasing to the eye, what, and social justice for them is not to attain something holy, it is to attain something that is pleasing because it is something that looks good. On the other hand, for us, Judea, for us Jews, being righteous is much more than that. That's how we become an Am Kadosh. You know how you become a holy nation? When you are sensitive to the welfare of others, when you respect their property, when you think how I can do for them. And you realize that there is something much, much more than what is rational and visible. So Abraham Avinu is walking into a region where the contrast here is between the Kadesh and the Sure, that which is holy, and the holy is not seen. But our tradition tells us that that is what keeps the world together. And if you want to have justice, if you rely on German philosophers, Heidegger is not going to be the one that's going to create a world of sensitivity. Why? Because he joined the Nazi party, even though he was considered the greatest philosopher in the 1920s. That's what we are told. We have to believe in a Kadesh. You have to go ahead and realize that there is something holy, and there's a holy and divine spirit in every person. That is how you create a civilization. And this is the message that Abraham has with this new society. So that's basically what this portion is about, right? Sdom versus Plishtim. Now, obviously, if you read this in the Torah, there are messages that are relevant today as well, very significant messages. And the shift that Abraham has to go through from interacting with the Sdom and then interacting with the rational Plishtim is a message for us as well. You know, we talked about the fact that um, the daughters, the, the story with Lot and his daughters are disturbing. It's a disturb. How does that happen? How does a person offer his daughters to perform a mitzvah. So, you know, in a pagan society, they be believe in charms, right? You have a necklace, you're protected. You chant, you say a few words, right? Mission accomplished. You have connected and you tapped into the gods, and the gods on your, are on your side. Can that occur within <coughs> Judaism itself as well? In other words, is there a danger that we practice Judaism, uh, but we start tapping into charms, things we say, Right? And mission accomplished. Right? That I go ahead and I swing something around my head and mission accomplished. I go to a river and I throw some things in, mission accomplished. Is there a danger that Judaism could turn into that? So the Rambam says yes. Maimonides tells us that if you believe that your mezuzah is like a charm, and therefore you believe, you know what, the mezuzah is there to protect me, so I have a good idea. I could boost my protection. I could upgrade it. You know how I'm going to upgrade it, says Maimonides? I'm going to write in the names of angels. So besides the two sections of the Torah there, I'm going to write in the name of a few angels, and then I got super extra protection. Maimonides says that's like paganism. Why? Because you are taking something that is a mitzvah. What is the purpose of the mitzvah? The mitzvah is to realize that when you walk in, when you walk in, and you think about the words that are in the mezuzah, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, that there is a God. And that even sometimes it appears that there yesterday was a great God because I had a wonderful day and the stock market went up. 
and today was a terrible day, everything went wrong. And it appears that there are two different forces that are fighting in the celestial realms. The reality is there's one God and there's a reason for everything. If I am mindful of the fact that there is a God and that he wants us to relate to him and appreciate him and to be committed to him, if I walk through the door, the mezuzah is something that's incredible. And Maimonides notes that even though we find in our traditions that there is an angel that protects you with the mezuzah, it means mindfulness. What does Maimonides tell us? Don't allow a mitzvah to turn into a charm that if you do it, then afterwards you can do whatever you want, right? No. A mitzvah is there to have an impact on you. It is supposed to change you. It is supposed to have an effect on the way you think and the way you practice. That is what a mitzvah is about. You know, they share a story that Rabbi Sharl Salanter had yard side uh, for, for a parent, I think for his father. And he walked into shul and he was planning to lead the congregation. And at that same time, a person walked in, an older man who had a yard side for a daughter. Now, if you go through the books, if you go through the letter of the law, the person who has yard side for a parent actually has what's known as kadima, has a right over the person who has for Lolaino a child. Rabbi Sharl Salan says to the person, you are going to be leading today. He, that's Rabbi, obviously afterwards his disciples wanted to know why did he violate right, what the halacha says. And he says, what do you mean? He had a deep emotional, uh, this is an emotional moment for him. I'm not going to take away something that will soothe him. For me to go ahead and have a kaddish, it's not worth it. He, he is suffering. He has an emotional need. That is how I make my decisions. That's the story with Rabbi Yisrael Salat. Now, if you walk in with char mode, meaning it's my obligation, I say the Kaddish mission accomplished in the spiritual realm, you would be willing to fight. And there have been fights in shuls, by the way, over these kind of things. Not here, obviously. But in other, right? There are, you take the approach of, of the charm, right? You're going to go ahead and if a person makes a mistake in practice, right? And says the wrong Kaddish. And says, Tiskabal when he shouldn't have. You'll throw something at him because you're damaging the impact in the spiritual realm. What about his feelings, right? My grandfather would say that a non-Jew will never understand <clears throat> the, the deep, Gra gratifying feeling of correcting a balkora. <laughs> <laughs> Only oh, you can really appreciate the correct a balkora is something that, why? There's a, that is a very dangerous reality that unfortunately we as Jews can take from a pagan society and that's why we are warned over and over again, don't do it. There was a great rabbinic thinker in Israel, his name was Rabbi Shlomo Volbe and Rabbi Volbe would warn that what I, what you have to remember is that Judaism is against frumkite. And people will be shocked, what, what do you mean? You're, you're a big, big beard and you're a big rabbi. Frumkite means being from religious, and he says Judaism is against frumkite. And he says what Judaism wants you is to fear God. To fear God is to assess every situation. Don't treat it as a charm. Don't believe that you have pressed the right buttons by uttering a few things. It's supposed to have an impact on your totality and your whole being. This is the warning. And therefore, when you think about Lot, right, you know what happens? He sees by Abraham Avinu Hachnasat or him, that is how you tap into the spiritual realm. That's how you are a righteous person. And it becomes so fundamental for him that he would, was willing to do the, the, the most corrupt thing possible, right, for a human being to do, to offer his daughters to fulfill the mitzvah, to get the benefit of the mitzvah. This is a corruption that comes from stone, from a pagan society, from a pagan society. This is what's happening there. And you have to remember that when you know, we talk about the fact uh, that there, there, are, there are merits. In other words, we do believe, you know, for example, uh, there was a story shared that there was a person that had a, a, a holy book from the Reb from uh, the Reb Elimelech of Lijansk, right? From the Noam Elimelech, he had a book that actually was uh, touched by Reb the, the, the Noam Elimelech, which was a great uh, Hasidic master in the beginning of the 19th century, and he kept it at home because he was was told from a great Rebbe that that protects the home. Now, a few years, a few uh, after some time, he had some guests over and he shared with them the story, and the book vanished. The book vanished. 
and it appeared that someone else felt, you know what, this is worth the protection. And they stole the book, and it was gone. And, you know, he noted that here we have, again, a corruption, that you take a work. Yes, there's a protection if you think about the righteousness of the person, and you think about his writings, and you think about his messages, and you have it at home, and you are mindful of it. Yes, there is a protection there because you become a better person. But if you think that you could steal it, right, and put it at home, and that is going to protect you, that is a charm culture. That's very, very dangerous. Now, by the way, we know in our tradition that when there's a righteous person in town, there's a benefit to the town. This is something that appears because when Yaakov Avinu leaves, right, leaves his, the land of Israel, we are told, it had an impact. But the impact of a righteous person is not just his presence, but when he has concern for others when he's involved in the welfare of the community, when he realizes that there's an issue and I have to address it, when you realize that it's not just the study of the Torah, but as the Talmud tells us, all matters of Torah are his responsibility because that is the concept of impact, just as a good deed, right? just as the mezuzah is there to impact our whole being, the righteous person is there to have an impact on others. So now let's go back to the language on page 82 where Abraham Avinu says, perhaps there are 50 people in, on page 82, verse 24. And he says, God Almighty, will you not tisa lema'an chamishim? Lema'an, for the sake. So Abraham Avinu says, you know what? If there, there are righteous people there, in their sake, in their merit, the city should be saved. And God, at the end of verse 26, responds and says, you know what? I will, v'nasati lechol hamakom, not lema'anam, not just in their merit, but ba'avuram, ba'avur. The word ba'avur is like leha'avir, to transfer. Meaning if they are there, and they are people who transfer values, who have an impact, who turn 50 righteous people in Sdom, who explain, who try to communicate, who through example and communication and education try to change the fabric and the essence of the Tzom philosophy, then I'll let them survive. Avram Avinu, it's not enough to just have them there, lema'anam, it has to be ba'avuram. This is uh, the, the, the message, the very important message that Almighty is giving even to Avram Avinu. You cannot allow the charm culture to play a role because that was the essence of Zdom, right? That, they were pagan. They believe that they go ahead and they worship the sun and then they can do whatever they want. That is a corrupt society, right? And therefore, it would only change if there are people that are there ba'avuram. This is the message uh, that we read. You know, we talk about Sdom. And the relevance is, number one, as mentioned, that you have to realize <coughs> that if there is corruption in, uh, in, in a society or in a system of education, right? If you just introduce religion, if you just introduce religion, you're going to create religion can, can turn into something pagan. You know, like there was a great thinker of Meir Simcha Dvins, who notes that Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the Luchos. He sees Klal Yisrael worshipping the golden calf. What does he do? He breaks it. Why does he break it? So Meir Simcha Dvins says, that if you give a pagan society something holy, you know what they're going to do? The holy item will be their new thing they worship. That's what he noted. And that's why it's dangerous when there's a commitment, quote unquote, you know, to mitzvot. But there's a corruption and there's no sensitivity towards others. And it becomes a priority. And you forget about being a decent person when there's no derech eretz. We have a significant problem here. That's the, the message that we take away from some. Now there's the practical message that we are not supposed to be like stomachs. A few, few weeks ago we had, uh, I live in, we live in Willowdale, right? And they had 18 people running, running for city council. Right? I don't know if you noted it, but very fast, a whole slew of people. And it was very hard to decide uh, who to vote for. So uh, on one of the, I think it was a Friday afternoon, uh, Fillion, John Fillion knocks on a door, right? I was going to offer him a, a comb or something. So Mr. Fillion knocks on, knocks on the door, and uh, he, I asked him the little bit I know, unfortunately, I asked him, what's your take of reducing lanes on, on young? What's your take? Because that's not, 
And he said, we have to stop thinking about the 905. We have to take care of what we need here in, in Willowdale, more parks. We should stop worrying about the 905. Okay. Now, <laughs> you, right? I didn't want to tell him, you know, about Midas, though. Now, I'm not, I'm not, but to say that, who cares if people coming from the north are going to have more traffic? We have to worry about ourselves. There's a little bit of a message there that, you know, I'm not telling you to create, to get rid of a whole neighbors and create highways, but there has to be a balance there, and yes. And you want he won't be nice. Yeah, that's because 17 other people, we have no way how to, you know, who, who they are and what they are about. Azaza, so good luck to, to young Swedish <laughs> with the new reality. That's what we have. So that's message number one. Now, when it comes, let's, let's move on a little bit to the society of the plishtim. To the society of the plishtim. You know, sometimes, sometimes I wonder that we have... I, I, I teach in chat. I teach in chat. And it's a nice school. There are kids from all kinds of different backgrounds. And sometimes I sense that you have kids that are, quote unquote, not from religious backgrounds, but they are ex the derecherets that these kids have is incredible. The decency, the sensitivity, right? And I'm, I'm in awe of it. And then sometimes I interact with, with kids of, on, on a more religious end of things. Right, and they are knowledge of Torah. They have knowledge of Torah, but when it comes to decency, to derecheres, it's lacking. Now, not in any way am I going to say that it's all true, but it's something that disturbs me because I believe in the value of both of them. And sometimes I note that when a system of education focuses on the religious stuff, right, and focuses on you know saying kriya shema properly and learning Torah properly, something got to give, and sometimes it's the derecheres. What this Parsha wants us to remember is, it is fundamental to have both. The first part of the Parsha, the stone <coughs> reminds us, you need derecheres. You don't turn into stone, right? Don't turn into stone. You need that derecheres. Because if you don't have the derecheres, you're going to rely on this charm that you are a good person, right? Because you ate and drank, or drank a high standard of foods and mission, to com mission accomplished. That is a danger. You know, the, the, we, we mentioned this Rabbi Wolber earlier. The Talmud shares with us a story of a rabbi who <clears throat> notes that this rabbi bemoaned that he's not as great as, at, not as, great as his dad. And someone <coughs> asked him, what, what do you mean you're not as great as your dad? He said, because my father, my father, and this is before the laws are established as we know it. My father, if he would eat fleshics one day, he would wait until the next day to eat milchiks. Mm -hmm. I myself don't wait as long, so I'm not as great as my dad. This is a statement in the Talmud. So all the commentators wonder, wait a second, if you believe that it's such a great thing, why not just you know, follow the practice, adopt the practice? So the, the Baal and Musar note, if you adopt a practice where you are not really holding there, you are not on that right level, that practice could be problematic in your Judaism because I'm, I'm, let's say, not such a perfect person, but I take a stringency. So then I think, you know what, I must be a good person because I have that stringency. To follow a stringency when you are not on that level, that could be destructive to your development. It has to match your derecherets, your sensitivity, your mindfulness. When you upgrade, then you could accept a humra stringency. To accept the stringency when you are not holding there, your stringency will become your identity and you will remain a corrupt person. This is what the Baalei Musar say. It is a concept that is very, very significant. Don't allow the charm to take over your practice of Judaism. Don't become a stomite that believe that all you got to do is satisfy the gods and then you could go ahead and punish the neighbor for welcoming <clears throat> someone. That is war now. What is the message of the second half of the Parsha, the Plishtim? So, you know, we study Tanakh, and we study about the miracles that occur in Tanakh. And we study about the fact that it was obvious that there's a higher being. That's what Tanakh is about. It is a text that brings us to the supernatural world. Now, we ask ourselves, there, if Torah has a message for all generations, where in Torah do they address the world we live in today? The world we live in today, God is concealed. Right? We, don't, we don't see, there are no nisim 
Obviously, what we are supposed to do is recognize that there is a God, and even the magnificent leaves that you see change in color, that is God Almighty, right? And the fact that you have breakfast today, or that we have uh, some magnificent food here for a snack, that is God as well. That we have to do, but you cannot call it me'ala teva. You cannot call it something that's a miracle. So we are going to be, where do we find in Torah the roots? How to have the proper <clears throat> attitude towards the world where God is concealed? And the answer is, the interaction with the Pelishtim. The interaction with Pelishtim, right? Per, turn, if you turn to page 98, he's interacting with Abimelech. And he wants to go ahead, Abraham Avinu wants to have an impact on, as mentioned, it's a rational civilization. How do you, what, what creates a rational civilization? A rational civilization is when they don't see anything occurring from the supernatural <laughs> realm, but they sense we have to think how we can do things. We have to understand the world better, right? We have to go at it with empirical evidence before we start determining what is effective and what is not effective. That is, if you want to talk about the cradle of Western civilization, of rational thinking, <coughs> is Greece. And the roots of Greece, of Derech Eretz, right, is going to be with the Plishtim. And what Avraham Avinu, remember, Avraham Avinu wants to have an impact on the world. While earlier on, when he's interacting with the stone world, he wants to talk about in a Kel Elyon, about this high god that is Elyon, that he's above all other gods. You worship all kind of pagan forces, they're nothing compared to the real god. That was his message when he's interacting with the pagans. Here he has to interact and he has to educate. And again, he does it through welcoming people. He does it through providing them what they need physically. He's doing it by providing for them what they need emotionally. But his main message is that you should know that a Kaddish Baruch Hu exists, that God Almighty exists even if he is concealed, even if you don't see him. If you look at the word Olam, we talk about the world Olam. The word Olam relates to the word He'elem, the Ha'alim, which means hide and concealed. And what Avraham Avinu wants to do, as he is interacting with this new world, with the rational people, right, with people that don't talk to them about miracles, don't talk to them about Baba Ma, tell them, tell them, interact with them with their rational way of thinking that God is concealed. Avraham Avinu and the Jews need to tell the world that Akkadish Baruch Hu is Kel Olam. He is the God, even if God Almighty is concealed. That is what changes, and that will clarify. If you turn to page 98, and when finally Avraham Avinu has the ability of communicating with the Plishtim, and he could open a center there of education. So we are told in verse 33, Vaita Eshel Biber Sheva, he plants this Eshel in Be'er Sheva, Vaikra Sham, and he calls out Bishem Hashem in the name of God. Name of God, end of verse 33, Kel Olam. Why specifically at this point? We never find this term beforehand. Why specifically here does he switch and he starts talking about Kel Olam? Because now he needs to get across that even if you, rational people, <coughs> believe that God is a concealed entity, he is in control of the world that you do not see. Kel Olam, the God, of, the God that conceals himself, but nevertheless, you have a responsibility of living by his values. That's the switch that occurs, and that's the tale of two cities and the impact that Avraham Avinu has. Thank you again to our sponsors, and every, everyone have a wonderful day.